Okay, if we could be turning in our Bibles, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. I'm going to read the first 20 verses, although we uh, may get further than that. But uh, just uh, for reading purposes, beginning in verse 1, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works in the cup <clears throat> which she had hath filled filled to her double how much she hath glorified herself and lived uh, deliciously uh, so much torment and sorrow give her for she hath said she saith in her heart i sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off from the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thigh and wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all <clears throat> excuse me manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass <clears throat> and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors of oint and ointments of frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men, and the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for, for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And again, God will bless that reading uh, from his precious word. So we're thinking this morning about judgment on commercial Babylon. And we want to, again, just emphasize that there's a definite distinction between chapter 17 and chapter 18. And, 
And of course, the differences, we've said already that a lot of symbolic language in chapter 17. But when you get to chapter 18, there's nothing symbolic. It's all pretty straightforward. And so, for instance, we had chapter 17, the symbol was a harlot woman. Whereas in this chapter, it's always talking about a great city. We'll point that out in a moment. Uh, in chapter uh, 17, uh, we have language like the woman, the whore, the mother of harlots. Uh, whereas here we have language like habitation, great city. We have a marketplace. We have merchants and business. Uh, in uh, 17, you've got uh, guilty of religious abominations. <clears throat> whereas in chapter 18, the guilt seems to be connected with greed and self-indulgence. Chapter 17, uh, she uh, is destroyed, this woman, by political power, by these 10 kings that give their power to the beast for one hour. And in chapter 18, the destruction is by a sudden act of God. Strong is the Lord God that judges her. And so quite clearly there's distinction. And of course, the, uh, the judgment uh, that comes from God is an earthquake which is also additionally hail and then fire that results from all of this. And so it's quite clearly a divine judgment on Babylon commercial. So we saw in chapter 17 <clears throat> that the beast had no use for religious Babylon once he had used her to bring himself to power. And uh, she was destroyed. We, we saw that in Chapter 17, verse 16 and 17, it says, The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, uh, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. The words of God shall be fulfilled. <clears throat> However, when it comes to commercial Babylon, <clears throat> we're going to see that he does have a use for commercial Babylon. And <clears throat> the beast is going to use it because, first of all, just think of it, when the religious Babylon is destroyed, think of the tremendous wealth that is linked with apostate religion. You think of Roman Catholicism, uh, always crying the poor mouth, uh, and yet the Vatican is stuffed with priceless treasures. And of course, all of that will be taken into the beast coffers. Uh, we think the Church of England, its palaces and real estate in central London, owning vast swathes of central London. Again, all that would come under the beast power. Uh, we think of the Mormon Church, its connection with so many uh, businesses, Marriott Hotels, Safeway Supermarkets. We could go on and on. And so <clears throat> all of this commercial Babylon will take in and will be uh, used by the beast until it's directly destroyed by God himself. <clears throat> I want you to notice um, that a big question in people's minds is this, will the city of Babylon be rebuilt? Because it seems to be a judgment on a literal city, an earthquake uh, in chapter 16. And uh, we, we read about uh, great Babylon came in remembrance before God. And so I want us just to go back to the book of Zechariah for a moment in chapter five. I'd like to suggest that actually it is a real city that is in view that will be rebuilt in the last days. <clears throat> you want to look at verse one of Zechariah chapter five. It says, then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll and he said to me, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll, the length thereof of 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth for everyone that steals uh, shall be cut off as this side according to it. And everyone that swear shall be cut off as to that side according to it. I'll bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and I shall enter into the house of the thief and the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and I shall, it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. And then verse five, then the angel that talked with me went forth and said to me, lift up now thine eyes and see what is this. 
that goeth forth. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is an ephod that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is resemblant to all the And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephod. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephod, and he cast the way of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came up two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said to me, To build an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. And so it's a picture of commercialism. When Israel came out of Babylon, what they learned in Babylon, they learned to detest idolatry. They're done with idols, but they also learned about commercial Babylon. They learned about commercialism and they brought it with them into the land of Israel. Of course, we know Israel, very industrious, very business savvy type people. But in the last days, God is going to take it back to the land of Shinar and rebuild it. This commercial center will be rebuilt in the last days. He said to me to build an house in the land of Shinar. It shall be established and set there upon her base. And so there seems to be strong evidence that Babylon will be a literal city that will be rebuilt in the last days in the land of Shinar. Of course, this was previously attempted by Saddam Hussein, uh, but unsuccessfully. He actually saw himself as Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated, and he tried to rebuild Babylon with all its glory, but as we know, failed miserably. I want you to notice in chapter 18 just how the phrase great city is used uh, in this chapter, because it really is emphasizing a great city. And so if you look at uh, verse 10 of chapter 18, it says, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, the mighty city. So clearly it's talking about a literal city. Uh, verse 16, and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet. Uh, verse 19, they cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships. And then, um, yeah, so verse 21, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, cast it to the sea, saying, thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down. And so this constant reference to this great city. I want you to notice, too, the emphasis on in this chapter on merchants and merchandise. And so notice, please, with me, verse 3. It says, All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the, the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 11, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. Verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver. Verse 15, the merchants of these things were made rich by her. And so is a city, merchants are getting rich because of dealing and interacting with this great city. And of course, in one hour, we read as God judges commercial Babylon, verse 17, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And, of course, we've seen that it will literally be burned with fire. Uh, it, verse 8, it says, uh, ver Therefore shall her place come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she, she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And so the judgment, and again, we, we believe from chapter 16, there will be a massive earthquake, followed by hail coming down from heaven, 100 pounds weight. And on top of that, of course, it will cause, uh, imagine earthquake, often electrical 
uh, especially a high-tech city in the last days. You can imagine the electrical uh, kind of chaos and the resultant fires, and it will literally be burned with fire as a result of this. And she'll be mourned by merchants and monarchs and mariners. It's kind of interesting as we kind of have a little outline uh, of the chapter, we'll, we'll notice it's kind of like a lamentation. It's like uh, just as Jeremiah, when Jerusalem was burned with fire, he wrote that book called The Lamentations of Jeremiah. Well, this is a, lam a, a lamentation chapter. And so we have, for instance, in verse 11, uh, the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. So you got the lamentation of the merchants. Uh, you have in verse uh, 17, the lamentation of the mariners. Uh, it talks about, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster, all the company and ships and sailors, as many as a trade by sea, stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning. And of course, the lamentation of monarchs. We saw that in verse 9. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication lived deliciously with her shall bewail her. So everybody's mourning from the monarch to the the merchants to the mariners because of the desolation of this great city. Uh, in one hour, so great riches come to nothing. Now, let's think a little bit further about the identity of the city. We we did mention, and we're coming from the perspective, at least my, my thoughts from scripture would be that it is really a rebuilt Babylon. But there are many that believe differently uh, they would suggest that Babylon is a code name for Rome uh, because Rome was the dominant power. Uh, so instead of writing Rome uh, that John uh, wrote, uh, Babylon is kind of a code. And of course, uh, those that advocate that view talk about the seven hills uh, as well in chapter 17, uh, verse 9, although it literally says seven mountains. And in scripture, mountains are always symbolic of kingdoms because it goes on about seven kings. But they put all that together and they say, you know, in the Old Testament, both Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied the destruction of Babylon and uh, uh, that uh, it was to be destroyed forever and would never be rebuilt. But it's interesting that uh, Babylon continued to exist long after the, uh, the defeat by the Medo-Persian Empire. And uh, it uh, continued to exist uh, even to the present day. There's uh, the site of ancient Babylon is, is now just a village, but it's continued to exist since then. And so clearly the, the dramatic uh, destruction that was spoken of uh, back in uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah has not been fulfilled fully yet. But it will be. And and so, again, it would be a conviction that it will be rebuilt as the commercial capital of the beast's empire, a literal place. And uh, so uh, that's that's the conviction. Uh, now, let's, let's jump into the passage. And I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of an outline of the passage in verses one through three. There's a cry announcing judgment. And we want to look at this great cry announcing the judgment on commercial Babylon. And then in verses four through eight, there's a call for any of the Lord's people that are in it to escape judgment. So a call to escape judgment. And then from verse 9 to 20, we see the classes that bewail judgment. And so we've got this, this lamentation of these various classes that we've considered. And then in verse 21 through 24, we have the completeness of the judgment. So really all about judgment, but it begins with this cry announcing judgment. And we notice it says in verse 1, after these things, I saw another angel uh, come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory or illuminated with his glory so the the angel coming down from heaven is so fresh from god's presence that he literally glows the 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 uh, the literally the presence of god that he's come from is reflected on his 
countenance uh, recently come from the presence of God uh, that he he shows a broad belt of light across the darkness of the earth and remember how dark the earth is at this particular moment some have suggested that maybe this is Christ and we've we've kind of argued against that throughout our exposition of this book because uh, again it seems to me that since he took on incarnation uh, the Lord Jesus never appears as the angel of the Lord uh, after that uh, he's taken a body he's a man in the glory he'll always be that way and so and of course another reason why we would dispute that it's Christ because the use of the word here I saw another angel the word another is another of the same kind another like the one that we saw in chapter 17 and and verse verse 1 there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me and so it's another of the same kind and so uh, it would seem to me that it's not the Lord Jesus, but it's an angel fresh from the presence of God. Now, of course, he's a mighty angel. Of that, there is no doubt. Another angel come down from heaven having great power, great authority, authority from the throne. That's where he's come from as a representative and a messenger from the divine throne. He has great authority. The earth is lightened with his glory. And so he comes, this angel, and again, it, it would seem to me another evidence that there's a distinction between chapter 17 religious babylon chapter 18 commercial babylon because why send another angel if it's the same story all the way through why is it necessary to send another angel but it's necessary to send another angel because again the judgment is different than we saw on religious Babylon or mystery Babylon in chapter 17. Now, verse two is a very interesting verse. It says, he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And then it has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So first of all, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. He announces this with repetition, and it's kind of like a solemn dirge of the damned. It's fallen, it's fallen. This kind of, again, this idea of lamentation, this idea of solemn dirge, it's fallen, it's fallen. And then it uses this term, it has become the habitation and then the hold. Now, a hold is a prison. And so this is very interesting, at least to, to my mind. It would seem that it denotes a prison where lesser demons, habitation of devils, and then every foul spirit. So again, demonic creatures and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, I just wonder if this idea of unclean and hateful bird it goes back to Matthew's gospel, chapter 13. I'd like us to just look there for a second, where we read in verse 31 and 32, it says, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in a field, uh, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And so, again, would it would it be something sinister here? Is, is it the idea of not just birds, but but some kind of satanic uh, kind of uh, uh, manifestation here? And so, I guess my thought is simply this: um, during the millennial kingdom, could it be? that one place on the earth won't be renewed. Remember, the Lord's going to renew the whole earth, but could it be that there's one place that is reserved as a prison house for lesser demons that will are held there awaiting final judgment? And perhaps you know how Satan, after the thousand years, is released for a little season. Perhaps these lesser spirits will uh, aid him uh, in his 
his task of gathering together all the rebels at the end of the thousand years and bringing them to attack and attempt to overthrow God and the holy city. And so could it be that there'll be one place in the millennial kingdom that will be under divine judgment, so to speak, and will be there as an example uh, to warn people, and yet at the same time will uh, be uh, a place where God is, as it were, reserving these demonic creatures for their last act before judgment. So it's just an interesting thing for us to consider, but it certainly says Babylon the Great, it is fallen and has become the habitation of devils. And again, because this is late on in the tribulation period, it seems strange to have it just described that way just for for a short time before we go into the millennial kingdom. So maybe it will continue that way in the millennial reign. In verse 3, it says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So the mention of nations, kings, and merchants is going to be very significant, as we've already said, shows the powerful influence of commercial Babylon in the world. Uh, they, they've, they've had influence uh, throughout the world, uh, this commercial Babylon, the political intrigues, if you like, of Babylon. And, and do we not see that today? The powerful influence of the corporate world over government policies, lobbyists. Uh, I know here in the United States, uh, the the lobbyists are very powerful and often represent in big pharma, big tech, big food, swaying government po government policies. Uh, we see how big tech is uh, through their censorship is affecting policy, is affecting opinion, is affecting the whole world. And so as we see this, uh, and I see commercial Babylon becoming more and more influential in the world, even right now, what's it going to be uh, when the beast takes it completely in his power? It's going to have incredible sway uh, over the world, over the kings, over the rulers, over everyone. And so certainly we can see this impact of commercial Babylon. And of course, uh, he says in, in verse four, now this is a, a summons from heaven and it's a call for God's people at that time to escape the judgment and so we notice he says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. So again, we're talking about tribulation saints. We're talking about people that are living at that time. And some of them uh, may be involved in commercial Babylon. And he's telling them uh, this, this rebuilt city uh, that is the center of world commerce. And he's telling them, to get out a literal flight from a literal doomed city. Echoes of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the angel went and told Lot, get out, judgment's coming. And this, I believe, is the thought here. Get out before judgment comes. And so the saints of that day are to be separated from everything that's Babylonish. And by the way, uh, that's true of every age, isn't it? We need to be separation from that which smells of Babylon needs to be seen in the lives of all saints. Now, I want you just to go back to a very early chapter in Scripture. Look at jo Joshua chapter 7. And I, just, I was just reading through Joshua right now in my devotions, and I really was uh, struck with this. In Joshua 7, verse 20 and 21, it's a story of Achan. And here's someone who's one of the covenant nation that have just come out of Egypt, that are coming into the land of promise. Uh, and it says in verse 20, Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment. And 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold and 50 shekels weight. And I coveted them and I took them and behold, they're hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. 
and the silver under it. Doesn't it show the influence of Babylon was already there in the land of Canaan? <laughs> Babylonish garments. And so, again, the call to depart from Babylon and the worldliness that it represents is a theme represented uh, throughout the word of God. And I want to just look at some some of these calls to come out of this world system and its values and its whole kind of way of thinking. And we see it over and over again in Scripture. God's, in a sense, has not changed his tune concerning the attitude of his people towards this hateful system. So let's go back to Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 52. Isaiah 52, verse 11 uh, we read this, it says, depart ye, depart ye, uh, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, but bear the vessels of the Lord, be separate, be clean, come out from the midst of her. Uh, Jeremiah, so a couple of references in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 50, verse 8, where Babylon is uh, about to be judged. Uh, by God in this prophecy of Jeremiah and his call to the people of God in verse eight, he says, remove out of the midst of Babylon, go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be and be as the he goats before the flocks. In other words, you just get out of there. Judgment is imminent. Chapter 51, verse 45. Again, just this idea of God calling his people out. Verse 45, my people go ye out of the midst of her and deliver you every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. Get out, judgment's coming. And of course, uh, in the New Testament, we have similar calls, don't we? Second uh, Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, he says, uh, Be ye not unequally yoked together with the unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part is he that believes with an infidel? So on and so forth. Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord of hosts. And then one other reference, Ephesians 5 and verse 11. Ephesians 5 verse 11 is called to separation. He says, in Ephesians 5, 11, he says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And so this call to the people of God living at that time, judgment is imminent on Babylon. And he is saying with a loud voice, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. Notice verse 5, it says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Do we not have a, a, a kind of a, a flashback to Genesis chapter 11? Remember, they built a city and a tower, and the tower was reaching up to heaven. And now he says, her sins have reached up to heaven. And so God says, uh, God hath remembered her iniquities. By the way, what a contrast that is concerning commercial Babylon. God's remembered her iniquities to what he says to the child of God. He says, I will remember their sins no more. Their sins and iniquities. I, the new covenant teaching, right, that, uh, that God has said to the child of God, I'll remember no more your sins and iniquities. And of course, as we take the cup, we're caused to remember that, right? That, that, that this is the new covenant in my blood, your sins and iniquities. I will remember them no more. He says, verse six, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her, double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled, uh, filled to her double. So God's righteous retribution against Babylon is to render her double. The word render is the word to pay a debt, to give back that which is due. But he says, repay her double according to her works. Uh, mix for her double. Now, why this emphasis on double? I want you to go back to the book of Exodus. And I want us to see that 
in in the Old Testament, when somebody was guilty of theft, Exodus 22, somebody was guilty of theft, theft and they were caught, they had to pay back double. And so I want us to see this, Exodus 22, and we'll begin reading in verse 4 down to verse 9. It says this, if the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. If a man shall cause a, a field or vineyard to be eaten and shall put in his beast and shall feed in another man's field of the beast of his own field and of the beast of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. If fire break out and catch in thorns, so the stacks of corn and the standing corn or the field be consumed thereof. He that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. If the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he have put his hand into his neighbor's goods. For all manner of trespass, whether it be for ox, for ass, for sheep, for raiment, for any manner of lost thing with which another challengeth to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. And so the implication here is this, that Babylon, commercial Babylon, has made her wealth through dishonest dealings. She's stolen from the people. And God says she will pay double. And of course, uh, there is much dishonesty uh, in the commercial world. That's why it's hard for God's people to be to be entrenched in it, because there is a dishonesty that is part of that whole system. And so verse seven, he says, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she hath says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. So the passage here, verse 7, represents really a threefold sin connected with commercial Babylon. Firstly, self-indulgence. She has lived luxuriously. She's lived deliciously, <laughs> luxuriously. The, the, the luxury connected with it. And of course, the corporate world, the higher you get up, the more luxury connected with it all. And so certainly self-indulgence. Second, pride. She's glorified herself. And notice how much she hath glorified herself. She sits as a queen. And so again, there's this pride element that has to be judged by God, the pridefulness of it all. Uh, man's cleverness <clears throat> and man taking glory for his cleverness in this commercial world. Thirdly, the avoidance of suffering. I am no widow and will not see sorrow. And so all these things characterize the worldliness and materialism that's connected with commercial Babylon. And so God is going to judge. Just look for a second at a couple of verses from the Old Testament, because you can see, I suppose, foreshadowings in the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah of this ultimate judgment that we see here in the book of Revelation. And so in Isaiah 50, verse 29, no, sorry, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 50 verse 29 and then we look at a verse in isaiah jeremiah 50 verse 29 it says call together the archers against babylon all ye that bend the bow camp against it round about let none thereof escape recompense her according to her work according to all that she hath done do unto her for she hath been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. And just as we saw uh, here in Revelation 18 about uh, the pridefulness uh, of, of her, uh, that uh, she uh, 
uh, how she glorified herself. And so we have that foreshadowing in Isaiah 47 and verse 8. Isaiah 47, verse 8. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. And so again, we just see this echo, don't we, from the Old Testament. And so as a result of this, he says in verse 8, he says, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the lord god who judgeth her she is sown to the wind she shall reap the whirlwind uh, notice the reference to plagues uh, remember that the seven last plagues were given to us in chapter 16 of the book of revelation once babylon burned jerusalem the subject of the lamentations of jeremiah now Babylon burns and the world laments. Earth's might crumbles before heaven's power. Strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. <clears throat> and it results in the sob of the earth. The judgment on commercial Babylon results in the sob of the earth. And so we've got this these lamentations now of monarchs, of mariners and of merchants and so we want to just kind of quickly look at these these lamentations uh, because this destruction is, is obviously economically devastating and so uh, it begins with this lamentation of the monarchs and so it says the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Now, if you remember that in chapter 17, the kings of the earth, particularly 10 of them that ruled with the man of sin for, for one hour, they did not lament at the destruction of religious Babylon. In fact, uh, they hated religious Babylon and they were happy to be to to be God's instruments of judging her, and so we 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 observed that in chapter seventeen, uh, where we said verse sixteen, the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, shall eat her flesh, burn her with fire. God hath put it in their hearts to fulfil His will and to agree to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So there's absolutely no lamentation of the kings when religious Babylon is destroyed. They're glad to see the back of her. But when commercial Babylon is destroyed, the kings mourn. Great lamentation because, again, their wealth, their, their decadence has come because of their trading with commercial Babylon. And so the lamentation of monarchs and then the lamentation of merchants, the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. So it seemed that this capital of the beast was, as it were, the economic engine of the world. And everybody uh, traded, uh, uh, brought their goods to this place of great wealth and decadence, this, this last day's city. Uh, and of course, we we get a list of of the various uh, traded items that were traded, and there are twenty eight items of merchandise in seven different categories that were traded. There's precious metal and jewels. There's costly clothing. There's material for making furnishings, furniture materials. There's vessels of wood and brass and iron and marble. There's there's special perfumes. There's food and wine. There's conveyances, horses and chariots. And so uh, all of these things, it, this place is buying all this stuff. It's it's kind of the economic engine of the world. And to see it fall brings great devastation to the merchants. The prophets of commercial Babylon have come through cruelly using others. Uh, I want you to notice that it, it talks uh, tragically uh, of uh, verse 13, 
it says uh, they traded in cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense as the perfumes, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, and beasts and sheep and horses. And notice this chariots, there's the conveyances and slaves and souls of men. One of the things that this evil system has been involved in is slavery and trading in the souls of men. We might say today, human trafficking. Part of commercial Babylon's uh, enterprise includes human trafficking, prostitution, pornography, all of this kind of stuff. And people being used, brought into slavery uh, to be used for commercial purposes. Uh, other aspect of slavery is the sweatshops in poorer nations where people literally are slaving uh, to, to supply the latest bling and whims of commercial Babylon. And so all of this comes to remembrance before God. All this brings about divine judgment because of the, the cruelty uh, and the wickedness uh, of the commercial Babylon system. I want you to notice too that there's a there's a great emphasis on the phrase "no more" uh, in these remaining chapter uh, verses, and so it says, uh, verse fourteen: "The fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more." at all uh, we see later on uh, again verse 21 uh, it says mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone cast it to the sea saying thus with violence shall the great city babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all uh, verse 22 the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee uh, again the end of the verse 22 it says here uh, the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. Verse 23, the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. Uh, the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For all thy merchants and thy great men of the earth, for by their sorceries were all nations deceived. And so her days of delicacies and luxuries are over, brought to an end. And so there's great lamentation over the merchants the monarchs and now the mariners and you've got to feel for the mariners in these last days here uh, notice the reference to them uh, this this lamentation of the mariners um, it says in verse 17 for in one hour uh, so great riches is come to naught and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning. And so uh, you, you think of what the last seven years of human uh, history before the coming of the Lord Jesus is going to be like for those involved in the shipping industry. We've already seen back in Revelation 8, and verse 3, Revelation 8, verse 3, we saw another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden incense. And there was given her much incense. That's not the person I'm looking for. Um, there we go, verse 9. Verse 8. The second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were part uh, which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So uh, trumpet judgments, Revelation, uh, in verse 8, verses 8 and 9, we see a third part of shipping is taken out of the equation, totally destroyed. But as commercial Babylon is being rebuilt, things begin to pick up. 
and the shipping industry experiences a revival, uh, taking all the materials for the building of the city. And so there's there's great hope. But then when we get to the bold judgments, Revelation 16 and verse 3, it says, The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. So at least at this point, we could say the fishing industry and all the, the commercial fishing fleets are going to be done away with because, because there's every living soul dies in the sea. So there's no, there's no fish. And so you've gone from the, the devastation of a third of it lost, third of all shipping. Now all the fishing fleets are, are redundant. They're all uh, stuck. There's no, there's no fish to, to catch. And then finally, just as again, there, there may be some measure of recovery because of commercial Babylon. And now commercial Babylon is destroyed and the mariners stand afar off and they are utterly devastated at the loss because again their livelihood is at stake they, they've become wealthy as a result of this trading and bringing the wealth to this uh, to this beast capital economic engine and so it says uh, for in one hour verse 17 so great riches is come to naught Every shipmaster, all the company and ship, sailors, many as trade by sea, stood afar off, cried as they saw the smoke of a burning. What city is like unto this great city, they say. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. And yet we're told, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And you say, well, how has commercial Babylon had any impact on apostles and prophets that God would judge you on her? And again, we have to say that increasingly um, in our day, the... Um, spread of the gospel commercial babylon is seeking to to now censor and prevent this taking place uh the preaching of the gospel uh, i just heard this week of a man trying to come into to canada and he had to sign a document to say that if he came in to speak he would not be allowed to speak on certain subjects and if he refused to sign he would be turned back at the border. Interesting. Uh, again, uh, you see the the various social media outlets. Uh, any anything that's contrary to commercial Babylon's uh, agenda is is basically silenced. Uh, and and you can see uh, medical doctors that don't accept the prevailing opinion of the World Health Organization, their accounts on the internet are shut down. Uh, it's just incredible. So, so we could say that, that in a very real way, and especially in the last days, commercial Babylon will do everything within its power to restrict the spread of the message of the gospel. And so we can expect it. If the day is coming, will be deplatformed maybe these messages <laughs> who knows the day may come when youtube will not allow it anymore and these days are coming and so the lord's people will rejoice over the destruction of commercial babylon because of its sinister influence throughout the world and so uh, our final section verse 21 through 24 is the symbolized doom of babylon and it kind of shows us the completeness of the judgment and notice it says and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone cast it into the sea saying thus with violence shall the great city babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone threw it into the sea Again, reminiscent of Jeremiah's instructions 
uh, to Sariah to bind a stone to a text of Jeremiah and cast it into the Euphrates. Uh, Jeremiah 51, thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her and they shall be weary. Uh, that's Jeremiah 51. But also, doesn't it remind us of the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew's gospel, chapter 18, where he said this in verse six, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was drowned in the depths of the sea. You know, I think as I look at commercial Babylon as it manifests itself today, and I think of the sexualization of children. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin. You think of the gaming industry. You think of the the TV and the cartoons. And you think of the, again, just the, the, the whole clothing industry. True little girls to dress like prostitutes almost this is this is going on in our day causing children to stumble a terrible terrible thing and so babylon it's one thing to sin yourself it's another thing to lead others into sin it's a very very serious thing and so babylon because of profit has led multitudes into sin, into a sinful lifestyle. And so it will fall. And the voice of harpers and musicians, all of these things we just read will no longer be part of her. And, and again, she has been responsible. And again, I think increasingly in the last days, she will be responsible for the murder of the people of god and anyone who objects to this powerful industry uh, and so notice one last word it says verse 23 the light of the candle shall shine no more in all at all in thee the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee for thy merchants were the great men of the earth for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived that's our word pharmakia again and it has the idea of preparing a drug. And we could say this, the lure of commercial Babylon is like a drug. <laughs> and in, in one sense, through seductive advertising, it's almost like the population is drugged. They they follow the latest trends. They follow the latest fashions. And they're, 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 they're drugged. They're, it's like they're just kind of almost comatose. And whatever Babylon tells them to do, they do. And so God's judgment on commercial Babylon is very much justified for her sins. And that is where our, our study ends for today. May God encourage us that this is coming to an end and the word is come out from her and be separate, saith the Lord. Amen.